But it's easy for me to be like, yeah, just go YOLO. Who cares? Like, nobody cares. Well, actually, when I was 22, like, I really cared. It was a huge deal there. Um, so I think, you know, that's that's a great path if you have that in you. Like, just go try some stuff and fail. There's no better way to learn it, just getting started. There's an entire generation of Americans who no longer care about prestige, titles, work travel, fancy offices, and lunches. Welcome to Mundane Millionaires, a podcast for this generation of small business owners who want to set their ego aside and focus on what matters, family, community, quality of life, and cash flows. In each episode, Eric Pasifici and Kevin Henderson uncover what it takes to get a little money in the bank, control your time, and invest in building great families and lives. Let's get started. Eric, Kevin. welcome back, man. No, you welcome back, Kevin. It's good to see you, man. How is this going to be our? Is this going to be our shtick now? No, there's no shit, Kevin. I just want. I'm. I'm welcoming you. It's good to see you, man. I hope it's, you feel uh, up always. There. Always a pleasure, even more so when we have uh, the man, the myth, the legend himself on the podcast, Mr. Michael Girdley. What a, what a oh, great I thought you were talking about me. Conversation. Um, Homer. That's definitely not going to become our shtick, Eric, just to be clear. Nice, right. <laughs> no, I, it, <laughs> this clown this, show. This is a, this is kind of a cool moment. Uh, cause, cause Michael Girdley is somebody that I just respect tremendously. I think everybody does. Mm -hmm. So that's not, not news to anybody, but you know, a really, really successful guy. And I'll give his background here in just a second. I think everybody who's listening to this is probably familiar with him to some extent, either through his Chili's memes. We get into Chili's, by the way. And what is it with Chili's? We talk about that. Uh, but, you know, the content that he shares, Kevin, is like, honestly, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the blueprint for guys like you and I that want to be taken seriously. Um, but also want to have a little bit of fun and want to kind of you know, like he puts it, make the world a better place through his teaching. Yeah. He really is. Uh, and I'll stop rambling here. And I'll let you talk, but he's, he's someone who epitomizes, you know, the two different points in the life cycle that our guests have really kind of fallen into thus far, which is, you know, we have a lot of really, you know, new entrepreneurs who have bought businesses recently or have started businesses or successful younger ish guys. And then we've had some really successful, you know, later career, more m mature uh, stage in their career, um, entrepreneurs like Curly. And it's really fun, I think, for somebody like me to talk to somebody like him and just pick his brain and say, well, how did you get where you are today? And yeah. if you were to start over from scratch tomorrow, what would you do? What would you do, do differently and how would you go about it? Um. So like always, I feel like I learned a few things, Kevin, what were your takeaways from today's episode? No, for sure. I think, I think the thing that's going to sit with me for a while to think about is this idea of effectuation, um, mm -hmm. which I hadn't heard before. And he, he directs to a couple of resources where he digs a little deeper. Um, so we'll, we'll try and dig some of those up for the show notes, but the, the, the idea or premise is, you know, a lot of business startups and things like that. And a good contrast would be like, I think if you think back to our Nick Huber episode, where he talks about a lot of his new ventures, he's literally going down his P&L of like, where am I spending the most money? Awesome. I'm going to go monetize that, start a business, uh, you know, that's providing a service where I'm already spending a lot of money in, in my core business, you know, kind of this, this lean startup idea of like, what's an issue I'm facing, you know, start a business to address that issue. Effectuation's different. And it's, it's more of a, it, it I'm going to put these words in, in Michael's mouth. Hopefully he doesn't disagree. It's more of a vision oriented approach to business building, which is what is the effect I want to put out in the world, the effect I want to have in the world, and then what entrepreneurial ventures, what business ventures support driving that effect. And, and an interesting contrast there would be recent episode, just a, a week or two before when this one will air, you know, with, with Chase Murdoch, where he's very localized and very invested in the community in Salt Lake and in Utah, where presumably there are great businesses in Colorado that Chase would, you know, from a financial perspective, from a P&L perspective, would be great for his portfolio, but that don't support the effect he's trying to have through his, his business interests, which is to really support and build his local community. Um, I, that I, for, 
for whatever reason, that's just really, really sat with me. A fascinating conversation about effectuation. I think it's gonna gonna sit with me for a while as I think about, you know, what what you and I are building together. You know, what what I'm building through other business ventures and, and with family, et cetera. Um, uh, just a really interesting concept. Are you building things without me, Kev? I'm kidding. That's a joke. All the t- uh, all the time. All, all the, the time. time. Yeah, yeah. All the time. Every time. Uh, all right. Let me let me just read uh, a quick intro to Michael Gurley, his his background here, just to, to prime the audience, and then we'll turn it over to the man, the myth, the legend. It says Michael Gurley has had a diverse and accomplished career as an entrepreneur, investor, and educator. Over the last three decades, he's built a holding company encompassing more than eleven businesses, which span various industries, including software, technology, consumer retail, and education. He's notably recognized as the chairman and co-founder of Dura Software, the second largest software company in San Antonio. Um, blah, blah, blah. Girdley's academic background was rooted in technology. His entrepreneurial journey includes founding several companies and nonprofits such as Code Up, Effectual Ventures, Red Runner Coffee, Dryline Partners, Near the Alamo Angels. Uh, he's also been actively involved in educational teaching activities, sharing his knowledge through a blog, a newsletter. Everybody should subscribe to his newsletter. It's fantastic. With uh, currently over 30,000 readers. And his Twitter account, at uh, Girdley, G-I-R-D-L-E-Y, has over 200,000 subscribers, uh, which we talk about the value of that and how he views yep. kind of the Twitter presence today, which I think is fascinating. Um, overall, if Fascinating guy. 2015 San Antonio Business Journal Business or Man Man of the Year, not Businessman of the Year, Man of the Year, which is quite the quite the accolade there. I'd love to get that someday. Well, I don't know if I'm man enough. Um uh, and no, then that's no 40 under 40, Eric. Oh, so touche, Kevin. Gotta be under 40 <laughs> to get that though. So you're out. Um indeed. You're out. I'm kidding. Uh but anyways. So Michael Gurley, obviously, uh, everybody probably knows him. So perhaps we should just start the interview. Kevin, what do you think? I love it. Let's jump right in. Uh, let it speak for itself. Everyone's going to enjoy Michael Gurley. So, uh, okay. Let me make, let me make my first lawyer joke. The, this is the first time I've talked to two lawyers so that having to bust out a thousand dollars. Well, it's coming. It's coming. So Sam, I'm actually going to drop from the call to keep the bills low. So Eric, you'll take Wait, it. Wait, we're the associates. <laughs> I, at where, I don't I get to pay only, 300 uh, an hour for oh, no, the They're on the call. We just don't let them talk. They just, they're, okay. they're that's here. Right. So. That's, that's the yeah. fun part. When you get on a call, there's only one voice, but then you get the bill for six people. You're like, wait, when did an environmental <laughs> lawyer sneak in? Okay. Sorry. That, I'll try no, to good. keep the, I'll try to keep the lawyer jokes to <laughs> we're, we're starting on a high note. <laughs> Michael, you're welcome to host too. If you want to just, I know this is kind of your, your jam. Kevin and I are, are novices compared to you. So feel free to run it if you want to. I'm sorry. Just, I don't want to ruin your podcast any more than I'm already doing. No, it's continue. <laughs> that's good. Trust me, any more than we've already done, it's fine. Um, well, good. Well, well, Michael, I referred to you as the senior statesman in the pre-call, which went over really well. Uh, I'm not that old, dude. I'm only 49. It's it's it's, ama- it's it, great to have you on. I rarely get nervous for anything in life. I think it's probably because I'm tired all the time, but uh, you know, excited to have the chance to talk to you today. You've, you've done a ton of your career and everybody I think that's listening to this knows you and kind of knows some of that story. And you've, you've told it many times on like my first million and things like that. So we won't belabor it, um, too much, but give us the high level, Michael, t- talk to us about your career, the, the career arc and where you are today. Yeah. So Thank you again for having me. I'll try not to make fun of you being lawyers anymore. I'm going to be the no, best guest. I, the, the I'm going to be the time. best terrible guest I could be. Um, yeah, so uh, I was always a computer kid, graduated um, from college. Uh, I chose a college as far away from San Antonio as possible. And I had a computer science degree and I had no interest in coming back to San Antonio. So I went out to Silicon Valley uh, and then I started to work. In the first phase of my career, I was working for other people. Uh, I was a programmer, and then I discovered I really liked people much more uh, than I liked being just in front of a computer and not talking to anyone, and uh, ended up moving into marketing and then eventually strategy and started to learn the business side of technology and you know, graduated from kind of that first phase of my career, having worked and been a product manager for like a half billion dollar a year software product. That's the beauty of Silicon Valley. You could be like a 25-year-old kid, and they're like, okay, you're a 25-year-old kid. Like You're in charge of a half billion dollars worth of revenue. Like, uh, let us know how that works out for you. And it's like, yeah, pretty magical stuff. Uh, and, you know, my wife, who uh, 
turned out is a very thin woman, was allergic to cold, and San Francisco was too cold for us. So we uh, got invited by my family to move back to San Antonio, which turns out is the opposite of cold. And uh, we uh, moved here, and I started the second phase of my career, which was being an entrepreneur uh, and went to go work for our family business. My dad at the time wanted to retire, and so I started my first CEO stint there uh, running our family fireworks business, which when I tell people the size of it, they're kind of like, what? Like we have 40 indoor stores around the state of Texas and a bunch of fireworks stands. So it's a pretty big business and it's actually professional wow. and stuff. And, um, so I always describe that as like the world's hardest business. Cause you're like, you're, you're like dealing with massive cash flow challenges. Your information feedback cycle is, is very compressed. Like you're, you know, the 4th of July and the New Year's sales are when we sell here in, in Texas yep. and like they're different seasons. So you only, whatever you learn, you know, all comes down to one night, you know, to some extent, because it's a very seasonal business that way. And then eventually, you know, I, I started the third phase of my career, which is what I do now, which is, um, you know, backing and supporting other people in companies and having ownership stakes in them. So, and I've done everything from, you know, venture capital to do venture to in venture creation, spoiler alert, I got, I got tired of that for multiple reasons. Uh, I've done a lot of business incubation and that's, I think really what I enjoy the most. Uh, and I've done it in all kinds of different industries, everything from coffee to real estate, to a um, software business, to a CEO peer network, to, you know, a IT backup stuff. <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm omnivorous in terms of the stuff I get involved in. Now we have a media company. So I find everything where I can find, you know, curiosity to be great. So, yeah, that's it. And and, and Michael, just put a finer point on that that in, in terms of how it worked temporally. Mm -hmm. So you went from stage one to stage two and became an entrepreneur at what age? Uh, 27. 27. 27. Okay. And you said you're 49. So you've been, you've been an entrepreneur for 22 years. How long did it take you in that 22 year cycle to get to the the phase three and say, Hey, I've done enough. Now I'm going to start doing some backing and supporting type of, you know, entrepreneurship 2.0 stuff. Yeah. So, uh, that was my late thirties. So I spent 36 until 36 or 37, just being a CEO of a single business. Then I incubated my first business, uh, at that point. And then at that point I realized, Oh, I can't really run three businesses. I couldn't even really run two. And it turns out I wasn't actually that good at running one. Um, so I needed to find people who would be better at that than me, but yeah, it was about a decade in of being an entrepreneur that I decided, okay, like I want to be a board member and like support CEOs rather than just have a day job of being a CEO. So, so then backing up and thinking about your kind of first step, you're leaving Silicon Valley. It's your first step into entrepreneurship. That was Alamo fireworks, right? And 100%. so what? What sort of led to that change? Like, what was it happening in your career? Was it more of an opportunistic thing with it being a family business? What prompted you at that point to say, hey, I'm going to step away from this track that I've started to build my career on and pivot to the family business, which, you know, I mean, unless it's a very, very tech enabled firework uh, sales company, it's, I mean, this is a complete pivot. You know, it's a 180 from what you'd been doing. Yeah, I showed up to the first day of work at the fireworks business, like in a like in a cotton press shirt and wool pants. And my dad was like, "What are you wearing?" Like, <laughs> it's great. It's like it's wrong like, uniform, Michael. He's like, oh, "What are you doing?" He's like, "Man, the cash um, register, Michael. What are you doing?" Right. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, well, you know, I think Kevin, when I was working for a big company, I graduated college and I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and I remember. I remember that when I graduated with a computer science degree, they had this like this goodbye senior luncheon and they got everybody together and uh, they went around the table and they asked each kid and I was one of them, hey, what are you going to do next? And one of them's like, I'm going to Wall Street. Another one's like, I'm going to Accenture. Another one's like, I'm going to work at this engineering firm, whatever. And they got around to me and I was just like, I don't want to do any of those things. <laughs> All those things, those guys just listed, I'm not doing any of those and I'm gonna, I haven't figured it out. You know, I had some savings. Yeah having worked during the summers and stuff and, and parents who helped me graduate with no debt. And uh, I was like, I, whatever those guys are doing, I don't want to do that. I always knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just didn't have the tool set or the ideas as a 22 year old to come up with anything good. And I, you know, I decided to move to Silicon Valley because that was the epicenter and still is the epicenter of tech. And, uh, 
you know, I felt like joining a big company would be a path to teach me about business. Notice sure. I didn't say entrepreneurship. And now right. I tell people, don't do what I did. If you want to learn how to work in a small company or you want to learn how to be an entrepreneur, like I think there's a great path where you go join a small company and you start to see how it works. And if you look at the numbers and the statistics actually around how VC companies get funded, they're often by older folks, but by and large, most of them have spent time working in VC-backed startups in the past. And I think that if you go, if you want to go start a business at some point, the ideal thing is to go start first at a small company and see how all that gets done. Otherwise, you end up at a big company where I was. And like, I didn't even know how to like buy an office chair, right? Because that all gets insulated from you when you're in a big company. Yeah. And I think that's, um, that was a mistake, you know, I would do differently now. I think it retarded my growth a bit. Uh, in terms of, you know, being able to experience what small business was like. It took until it took until I went and joined my dad and my family to really see like, oh, like this is a lot grittier than it felt like when I was at a 5,000 person company. Did, did you even during that phase, though, when you were coming out of college and working in Silicon Valley, you had this interest in entrepreneurship. Did you think it was going to go the way of kind of small business kind of boring business, drive-by Main Street business type of entrepreneurship? Or were you at that time going to Silicon Valley thinking you're going to get your business chops, you're going to do a tech startup, you're going to go the classic, like raise angel and VC funding and and build kind of the next big thing? Like what, yeah. what was your sort of vision going into that early phase? All right. I was a 22-year-old kid. I had no freaking clue about any of that. No stuff. vision. <laughs> it's yeah. just like looking for yeah. So you were, you were not... Zuckerberg is what you're. It's the Steve, uh, the Steve well, Jobs I, quote, the connecting the dots in in hindsight versus looking forward. I I would guess, right? hundred uh, percent. Yeah, I think uh, I was a 22 year old kid who went to a college in rural Pennsylvania where there was no concept of entrepreneurship studies whatsoever. Like they didn't even have an entrepreneurship program. I I described to you how the computer science program went. Like like starting a business when you, at that school was just like you might as well be an alien. Um, right. So, you know, I think that was where I tried to get myself into a place in Silicon Valley where I was like, okay, like I've been in the hinterlands of San Antonio. I've been in the hinterlands of Pennsylvania. Like there's a bigger world out there and I need to go find it and I'm going to get there. And I think walking into getting a big company job, I was just trying to make sure I had enough money to cover rent, which by the way, back then you could rent a room in San Francisco in a nice neighborhood for 650 bucks a month. Like wow. it's, a little, it's a different planet. Um and so I think I got exposed to a lot of those things like startups and, and that sort of thing. But at the time, like I went and joined a big company. So it felt very corporate. There were people who were living that lifelong corporate life. And I recall feeling over those first few years, like I was a bit of an alien in there. Like I did, I, I was like, I don't want to be these guys who are going to be here for 30 years. This sucks. Like I yeah. sat next to a guy who was 50 and he's in a cubicle. I was like, I don't think I want to be in a cubicle when I'm 50. <laughs> I remember being at my large law firm and they went around and they celebrated all the secretaries that had been there for like 20, 25, 30 years. And I remember looking right. at these women and just feeling like, dude, if that's me, like, I know, just know, like, this is never going to be me. Um, but I had this conversation the other, the other night with uh, a couple of people that are entrepreneurs now that started in, you know, very sophisticated white collar institutions. The one she had been at um, a large financial institution for you know, a decade. She's probably in her early to mid thirties. And then she, you know, she moved down to Orlando during the pandemic and, you know, her managing director said, if you go, you're never going to come back. And she's like, no, 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 I'll be back. Next thing you know, she's, you know, in full-blown entrepreneurship, they've got a farm. They're trying to get this backhoe out of the muck in the farm. And they're like yeah. working and trying to prepare it for RV lots and the like. And she's like, I spent the last decade doing various things in investment banking that did not prepare me at all for right. life on Main Street and life in real business. And so my question, and I've got my thoughts on it, Mike, but if you were to start over tomorrow, knowing what you know now, would you still go kind of the traditional route first and try Silicon Valley and do some of the institutional stuff just to have that experience? Or would you say that was not accretive to where I am today? I like where I am, so I would have started a little bit earlier in, on Main Street, or what would you do differently? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I've, I've written some threads on this, I think there are two interesting paths. Um, one interesting path, looking back on it, would be just just get out there and take some more risks. Like, I look back on it, and I, I was just too, too kind of patient or too kind of like, well, I'll figure it out in a few years. Like, 
Like, I think your early 20s are just a great time to take some chances. And I would tell young me to do that. Now, I also remember how young me was kind of a wimp. And it was like, okay, well, it's it's easy to be the old guy and show up be like, hey, I'm 49, by the way, not 50, Eric, just a reminder. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> not that yeah, old to yet. To be clear. No, I got uh, you. I got you. But, you know, it's easy for me to be like, yeah, just go YOLO. Who cares? Like, nobody cares. Well, actually, when I was 22, like, I really cared. <laughs> like, I, was, yeah. I didn't, it was, it was a huge deal there. Um, so I think, you know, that's that's a great path if you have that in you. Like, just go try some stuff and fail. There's no better way to learn it, just getting started. I think a safer and more interesting path is what we see folks like our mutual friend Heather Anderson doing. Like, go into an industry, learn that industry really well for a couple of years, and then leverage that as a path to escape and go become an entrepreneur. Um, just like, I mean, to some extent, you know, your path, Eric, where you learned a lot about the law and how the law world works and all that kind of stuff by working at a big firm. And that's equipped you with an unfair advantage starting your firm now. And so I think that's another path that I would encourage people to consider, like go find an industry that's interesting, go work for somebody that you admire, that you can learn a lot from. And then you'll look up after a couple of years, you'll be like, these guys could do it. I could totally do this too. Plus you'll have knowledge of an industry that, you know, in Heather's case, for example, like she's killing it because she has better insights into how all these SBA lending banks work than anybody else on the market. I mean, just because she worked on the other side for years. Yeah. And, she's not uh, learning as she goes. Yeah. Yeah. She doesn't have to figure it out. And she got, she knew what she was getting into from, from right. the beginning. So, right. Yeah. So let's let's switch gears for a second. So you you walk into dad's business. You've left Silicon Valley. You've come home. Y your wife's happy because it's a little bit warmer in South Texas. Uh, but you walk into dad's business on day one. You're overdressed. What's that like to to walk in as the young guy into a family business like that? And how many years were you in the business? And wh what did that part of your career look like? Yeah, I think I got an amazing opportunity that my dad was excited to work alongside me and mentor me and teach me everything he knew. And uh, I think that's an unfair advantage, right? That we can give our kids and, and my wife and yeah. I try to do it. Like we talk about our businesses and we talk about the ups and downs and things we're learning and things going on so they can get exposed to it as well. And my dad was so generous with his time, uh, with the effort that he put in, um, with sharing with his family, the benefits of his success. Like you know, some people come in, they're like, I'm self-made man. I, and I'm like, no, no, <laughs> like I'm like super privileged and I'm very grateful for it. And that's why I try to give back so much. But, you know, looking back on it, like I came in, I didn't know anything. I, I definitely had a bigger head uh, about how much I thought I had learned in Silicon Valley and all this stuff. And there was just a bunch of stuff I just didn't know. And my dad yeah. was ultimately super patient with me, super kind, super giving. And, uh, you know, I've learned some amazing lessons from him that helped me get to where I am today. So, yeah, definitely to be more transparent about me at that time. And I was probably cocky. Uh, I was probably gruff to a lot of the staff. I tell some stories about me not being a good boss because I didn't listen to them. Uh, you know, I was a 28-year-old idiot. I mean, that's just the reality yeah. of it. So The thought you knew better, uh, yeah. So you were yeah. you were CEO on day one or what, how, what was the transition like? Uh, the It took a couple years for my father to formally transition out. Um, and it's getting kind of scary actually, because the, the age at which my father transitioned out is not that much older than me now. It's like, wow, my dad's pretty smart. Uh, and he's had a great life since then. He's, he, his hobbies are amazing. Um, but yeah, it took a couple of years there. And I think we were classically the business that was run as the, the genius with a thousand helpers structure. You guys have heard of that. So, you know, that was hub and spoke kind of management. My dad managed everybody. And there were people that had been there from twenty for 25, 35 years. And we had we had never been a family that had done a study about how business organization works and good principles of management and all that kind of stuff. You know, we you weren't were doing even like doing all, yeah, we weren't even doing audited financials <laughs> until re, until a few years ago. So, you know, those are all just the types of things where because fortunately I'd been exposed to some of that more sophisticated stuff and the things you professionalize a business with, we were able to start to put that stuff into. But, you know, eventually my dad retired after three or four years and does, left the company and yeah, that's it. And are you, are you an only child, Michael, or do you have siblings that were running the business with you or they had their own things going on or what, what did it look like in terms of that succession? Was it just from, from father to you or? 
Uh, so eventually, early on, we were the family where nobody was interested in being in the family business. And then suddenly everybody got interested in being the family business once, okay. once reality hit. You're like, ah, yeah. oh. like, this could be a lot better if I owned a business. Yeah. Um, but I was the first kid. I'm the oldest. Uh, so I have a younger sister and a younger brother. Um, so I was the first kid to express an interest and I came back to the business first. Yeah. Uh, and then my brother uh, ended up joining the business several years later. And today he and I are partners in the business. So we're the two okay. board members. 50-50? Uh, no, it is. Uh, I get to make, I get, I get to break the ties. 51 for that. Okay. Yeah. So dad, so dad did ultimately yeah, that's sell like, you the that's business. That's like me and Eric. <laughs> well, I always uh, wonder well, about I, that I, because I, it's, it's awfully convenient for an aging business owner to have kids that want to work in the business and then to kind of string them along from an equity perspective. Right. And yeah. then also later in your, you know, now they're in their 60s, 70s, they're not working, but they're still living off the income of the business. They don't necessarily want to sell it. That is a very tricky dynamic to navigate. Uh, so much so that I think that that's part of why some of these businesses ultimately get sold is just yep. not even wanting to deal with that. Um, so, well, so I anyways, think, you don't have I to tell the, us specifically what happened with you, but. Oh yeah. I was just going to say, I think the genius thing that I would encourage more people to look at is this whole idea of owning the property for your business. And, you know, the fireworks business is a fireworks business that actually masquerades as a logistics business. Or it's, I'm sorry, I'll, I'm, oh, I'm ruining my, I'm ruining my bit. Yeah. I'm ruining my bit. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a real estate business that actually masquerades as a logistics business that masquerades as a fireworks business. So the logistics okay. is like, remember we open 200 locations twice a year within the span of a couple of weeks and then we shut them down. Like, so they're yeah. staffed. I mean, it's like, it's a massive logistics undertaking, but underneath that it's an engine where, you know, I think many families and ours is one of those you have an opportunity to create the wealth for certain members who are passive in the business through the form of real estate and so that's one of the beautiful things i think we've been able to do is separate that out and you know there's you know my parents have a great real estate portfolio they've built and gives them terrific income my brother and i are doing the same thing so we're acquiring properties all the time um, so that's one way of dealing with kind of that, okay, well, what happens to, you know, dad's cash flow and how does he make his boat payment? Like, well, okay, <laughs> like here's how it gets dealt with. And dad has no risk because he's just a landlord. Um, right. So I think that's a great option. That's something we did that's really created a lot of family harmony through the whole thing. And I think it's worked yeah. out well. Can, can we, and can we actually pause on that for a second? Because you're in an interesting position where you've already been through one phase of what I think a, what drives a lot of searchers in terms of, you know, a lot of people coming to search and buying these businesses are wanting to start that legacy of building something to pass on to family, et cetera. You've already been through a generation of that. I, I'm just curious, having been through it and then now thinking forward, building your own ventures and, and having your own family, maybe like, I don't know the way you want to approach it, but like kind of top three pieces of advice or, or whatever in, in terms of how you think about this multi-generational planning. Like what did your father do really well in planning how succession was going to happen to kids? What do you think could have been different that you're trying to do with your family and, and so forth? I think it'd be interesting for a lot of people who are approaching search you, with that mentality. You, before you answer that, you know, what's funny is I just read an article about how Eminem will no longer play that song. He wrote about his mom in like yeah. 1991. I read that out same the article, yeah. So, yeah, so just, you know, be careful, Michael, with what you say. You might live to regret it. Uh, yeah, no, uh, okay. We'll give, <laughs> I will give some politically correct answers. Um, look, I think, I, I think you're right that it creates this like incredibly challenging thing to come through. Uh, I think everybody in the family for sure on our side had the mindset and understanding that generational stuff and family dynamics, you're always going to have that tension, right? And there's going to be conflicts and stuff that happen. And I think we did a great job just as a family through habits of trying to work through them, right? And I think back of years of people being miserable or angry at each other or whatever, and like it's kind of turned out to be very delightful. So that's, that's number one, I think is just People having the mindset that's kind of like a marriage, right? If you want this family dynamic to work, you have to work at it. Um, I think there is number two, um, an attitude that we've always had that it's there's there's money that's in our family, and then there's money that's outside the family or other people. And like 
instead of looking at it as my money and then the, the other family members have their money. And so we're very smart, I think, about when being selfless, right? Like if, if the money's going to my dad or brother or other people, like, like that's a win, like yeah. going through all that stuff. Um, and then I think we've structured stuff really well. You know, I talked about the elegance of this, this property, um, you know, Propco versus Opco type stuff, which has worked out really well. Uh, I think there's just other really smart things like we've done. We talked about kind of the 50-50 thing. Like one thing you see these business owners do is retire and, okay, every kid gets 50%. Like both of you now figure it out, guys, because I was too much of a wimp to figure out one, you know, to figure out some sort of break the tie situation. So now your life's going to yeah. suck. And then, and oh, oh, have fun when one of you gets divorced. Let me know how that works yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've been very smart about being like, okay, there's clear like authority on who gets to make decisions, who gets to break ties, who's doing what, uh, clear delineations around um, you know, doing stuff professionally. Like if there's a property that the company's using, it needs to pay a market rent. You can't just like do brother-in-law type things and hope yeah. that that's going to like work in the sustainably in the long term. And um, so I think just, you know, th those level of just kind of professionalizing, having the right mindset are things we did right. And I think that's why we're hopefully going to be, you know, go from the fourth to the fifth generation owners of the business if, if we decide. Well, that's to. the logical next question is what happens next, right? So, I mean, I, it makes sense to me when it's, you know, one or two siblings, uh, but then you get the grandkids involved and it and it gets sliced and diced even further. Is is there a point with which it's not no longer tenable to keep it in the family, in your opinion? I definitely think so. There's also, and this is something you guys probably see in sellers as well. And I've, I've learned that this is a thing. People are sometimes like, why are they selling this amazing business? And sometimes you talk to sellers and I've been one where you're just like, I'm just tired. Like I've just, I've been at this for 12 or 15 years and I've just had enough. Um, you know, and I, I saw that in some of my family members after 25 years, they were just like, can't take it anymore. Like yeah, I want to do done. something different. Yeah. I'm just tired of this. So so I think that brings up a really good point, Eric. And just to be transparent, like I still feel young, like I'm 49 and I don't think we've figured out all that stuff other than I've done the whole trust type deal to yeah. deal with the estate exemption and all that kind of stuff um, and be prepared when it's time to figure out what liquidation looks like and that sort of thing. Uh, I don't have it figured out. I mean, I'll just straight up tell you, we we don't have it figured out. We can, we can keep going, uh, but I still feel... I still feel young and I'm just starting to go through this process of figuring out, okay, what do I want my life to look like when I'm 69 and I'm 49 right now? I I, I don't have a good answer for you. Maybe we start selling stuff. Maybe mean there's a professionalized management company that takes over from me. Everybody has shares in that. Uh, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, if, you, if you know what it is, tell me. Otherwise, <laughs> I need a couple That's, more years to figure it out. Eric's got the secret. I'm, Eric? I'm much younger than you, Michael, so I need to ask you these type of questions. You're, you're the guest here, so. Uh, but I think th th what I want to hear about, uh, you, you know, is you, so you go on, you, you, you start Dura software, 50, 50 partners, Dura software, and you've, you've been through now a number of diversified business ventures. I think when Kevin and I were talking beforehand, we were looking at your, 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 your CV or whatever, your resume, your career, we were struck by how diverse the different things you've done from fireworks to software, to coffee, uh, coding boot camp. Um, talk to us about how you think about business general. I know you recently divested the the coffee business. And I think at the time you had said maybe, maybe that was from fatigue. It was immediately after the sale, but you were like, no more, you know, hard asset uh, type businesses. Um, talk to us about business generally and, and your philosophy on, on businesses after all this diversified experience. Yeah, a bunch of different stuff. I mean, I think number one, I see a lot of people get attracted to things uh, based on the dream or the concept of them. And I think that's backwards, right? I think, I think what they should be thinking about is what sort of lifestyle do they want to have? And then how does that afford, how does that business support that? So I think I've definitely come to that mind, especially after being chained to businesses where like either they're demanding cash all the time due to high CapEx or whatever. Like I want businesses to exist to make my life better. And too many times I feel like I've gotten into situations where the business was like a perpetual infant, right? And I was stuck doing that kind of stuff. So I would say that's that's for sure something that I've changed my mind about. Um, number two, I think for sure, there's this all business tastes like chicken idea. You know, 80% of the stuff, oftentimes 90% of the stuff across all small businesses is just the same exact 
20 or so principles. Um, I think number three for sure is you know, how I end up in these like various corners is because uh, I use this process called effectuation to create new businesses. It's designed, it's identified by this uh, professor out of UVA. And it's a set of principles that I've kind of backdoor discovered a bunch of entrepreneurs like me start with what they're good at and use that to build ventures rather than have some dream. Um, so that's definitely changed from kind of lean startup or waterfall model for me. Um, I'll pause there. That's that's top three. I can keep going if you want. I got out. I got hours of those. No, I I love it. I think the first principle is an interesting one for Kevin and I because I think we 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 mistakenly found our way into this in our first entrepreneurial venture. We kind of built the business that we wanted for ourselves within what we were already doing yeah. in the law and said, you know, we want control. I I guess the entrepreneurial elements of it, although that's maybe a little illusory, but. Um, but the remote work I think was the biggest thing for us and just kind of having the control of where we are, when we, you know, what type of clients we take on, what type of work we do. Um, and that's made, you know, the zero from one process, I think infinitely better maybe than if we were trying to do something because we thought it was a good business, but it wasn't necessarily, you know, the right fit for us. Uh, cause zero to one is hard, but I think doing it in a situation where I go, okay, like at least I really like what my day to day looks like to an extent. <laughs> Kevin, don't laugh. Um, <laughs> you know, it makes it a lot better. Uh, but I, I want to hear about effectuation. Um, this is is this something that this yeah. If, is you, a, you, if you saw me looking off screen while you were talking, right. it's because I was taking a we note were both to like dig deeper on this. Yeah. I actually I was putting yeah. it in the chat GPT. I was like, give me the elements of effectuation. So tell us about effectuation. There's six is principles. This, uh, yeah. If you have a um, if you have a moment, actually, I did a podcast with Alex Lieberman, uh, and I know it's a cardinal sin to come out as a podcast guest and <laughs> recommend another podcast. But no, he uh, he Please. interviewed me, and I basically walked him through the whole effectuation process. And I've done a couple of YouTube videos on it as well. Oh, cool! But basically, like if you think about from a macro thing, you think about how business ideas get created, or at least innovative ones, where you're doing something that's not just yet another business. Um, you have lean startup, which is typically you go speak to customers, you understand what their problems are in a given space, and then you try to build a solution for it and you validate it and it's done that way. Okay. So that's that's customer a customer problem-centric way. The second way you can go do it is you can do the waterfall model, which is classic VC, and you go say, okay, we're going to have a vision that there's going to be this massive network of everybody with their phones, able to click a button and a taxi come sh shows up, and we're going to revolutionize transportation that way, and we're going to iterate our way to get there. That's a waterfall. What effectuation is, and I discovered late that I was actually following this model because I was copying entrepreneurs that I thought were really smart. And it turns out we all kind of use the same thing, which is you started very first with the effect you can create on the world. In other words, what are your strengths that you have that are unfair advantages? And you go do, run experiments and ideate around that particular thing. So for example, when we started the coding bootcamp, like I had written four books on computer programming, had a back, back uh, uh, you know, a background in enterprise software. Um, and then I knew people who were programmers and I knew people who wanted to hire programmers. And it's like, okay, well, like I have some unfair advantages. I'm going to do that. Um, and the same thing is happening like with our media business too. Like, oh, I happen to have 200 whatever thousand Twitter followers, which doesn't mean anything anymore. But like I can go build a business around this that can help all my other business. So that is this idea of effectuation is you start first and foremost with what you can affect upon the world. And then there's a bunch of principles used to go build out ideas around that. And I'll pause there, but I can, I can dig in further to those. Well, I want to, I mean, my, my heart follows this, this comment you just made on Twitter and how you feel like your 200,000 followers, you know, was your superpower maybe a year ago is no longer your superpower. You think that that value has been completely diminished or diminished to a, material extent by the changes in the platform? Oh, I think uh, what I meant by that is that follower count now is just a vanity metric. So you can have 200,000 follower accounts and one has alienated everybody via putting out crappy content and the algo doesn't, doesn't show their stuff to other people. Uh, or you can have somebody who's getting massive viewer numbers. And to some extent, that's why you see people also who have 50,000 followers who get more Twitter monetization than I do, right? And I don't even know what their page page views are. Um, I'm just shy of 20 I don't understand it month. anymore. I, I yeah, think, I it's, it, I think I it's a random number generator. 
I mean, I'll be you, honest with you. You, you think so? Did you see my post? No. I had 65 million impressions in, in January. Most yeah. of those were the 12th through the through the 30th or whatever, the 12th through the end of the month. Uh, and um, they paid me 300 bucks. So I don't, I yeah. don't know. I've, I have and then no there's people with with a tenth the followers of you and I. They got nine hundred dollars. So I have no idea. Yeah, which my commentary was like, I I actually hesitated about tweeting about it because I'm like, I don't want people to think that like I really am here for these silly payouts because I'm genuinely not. But it also is like a little like it's funny, you know. If you're chasing 100%. those numbers, you're making a mistake. I think. Um, yeah. So, well. I mean, I think it's also a reminder that all views are not created equal, especially on social media. Like there's, I've had some of my big, biggest months and it's like, I, don't, I didn't feel like I accomplished much in terms of what I want to do to help them make the world a better place. They're just junk views. Like me tweeting about Airbnb, like, okay, great. I got 5 million views. Like who really cares? Uh, I'm much more excited. It was about, a great tip. Like, that was a great tip though. Uh, it works every time. hundred percent of the time. It did. I hundred percent of the time, every time. The tip, the tip was you find the property on airbnb then you go to the separate website you get a reduced rate um like that's genius i don't i don't know why i've never thought of that so kudos <laughs> thank you you made the world this a, you made my this world episode a better is, place this episode is not sponsored by airbnb, <laughs> by airbnb. yeah for sure it's gonna be trimmed out we don't want to get sued uh so, go ahead Kevin. so to, to circle back to just for a second for effectuation when you say effect on the world you know what what are we talking about and you you made passing reference just a second ago to, you know, content being put out and whatever, having the type of effect on the world that you want to have. Like, what does that look like? What are we talking about? And what is that for Michael Gerg? Like, what is the ultimate effect that's driving what you're doing in, in these business ventures yeah. that you're trying to manifest? You're pretty invested yeah. in San Antonio, right? Is that part of it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, you know, I think what COVID did for me really was change my my world from just being a local view of stuff to very much more a global one, you know, like we have a staffing business now. And, yeah. you know, I think I saw the world much more as an us versus them, San Antonio versus the world kind of thing. And now I've, I, I feel like Twitter and I mean, look at, I mean, I'm friends with you guys. I, you know, Kevin, I think you and I are the only ones that have seen each other face to face. And even then, like yeah. it was for, hey, a, how's for it a hot <laughs> second. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Can't, okay. I can't afford, yeah. I can't afford to get you to come to anything, Michael. So. Uh, okay. It's a high <laughs> well, price. <laughs> I mean, if you're if you're that in love with the weather in San Antonio, it's hard to imagine you in, enjoy many other places. I mean, you may have the distinguishment of being the only person I've ever met that has said San Antonio weather is preferable to San Francisco. So, uh, uh, you maybe know, what? it's just I tough mean, to get Michael Girdley to travel. I, I do. I do say no to a lot of stuff, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> the thing I didn't like, the two things I didn't really like about San Francisco, number one. Like growing up in San Antonio, you grow up learning how to sweat because like, and it's just that kind of, it's like perpetual sauna feeling. Like I always just feel healthier yeah. in San Antonio because you're just working stuff, you know, as my dad would say, gunk out of your system by sweating it out. Number two is like the thing I love most about San Antonio and I've learned has shaped me as a human being a ton is this is a majority Hispanic city and like my sense of humor, a lot of my worldview, like a lot of it is carry over. Even like when I, I'm learning Spanish, even when I learn Spanish, I have a Mexican accent when I speak Spanish. And like, you know, the, the my Spaniard, my Spaniard, uh, Spanish student would be like, no Mexican, no Mexican words. You need to use real Spanish. But so, you know, the thing I didn't like so much about San Francisco is I just didn't feel like as comfortable in it because the minority there is majority, you know, Asian American. Right. And like, it just, the humor doesn't translate. The food doesn't translate. The whole attitude gotcha. doesn't translate. And, uh, so yeah, so that's why I think for me that in the sweating, huge benefits of Santa. Yeah. yeah. Fair, fair, fair enough. It's a funny side story. Uh, when we lived in London, one of our best friends that lived with us was Colombian that moved to the UK. Yeah to learn English and was living with us. And so my wife would help her with English. She got the same thing when she would go to her actual English classes would be like, you're speaking American because she was learning from my wife and I like stop speaking American. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. The the accent thing's a funny thing. Uh, my wife and I both speak Spanish as well. And she spent time in Spain. I grew up in San Diego. So our, our approaches are very different as yeah. well. So anyway. Uh, so anyway, if we can, I think one of you asked about like, why do all this stuff? Like why, yeah. why do this? And I think, yeah. I think the beautiful journey of 
being thoughtful and trying to think about and intentional about the life you want to live is between really like 25 and 45. I think the people that have that kind of inclination, they really start to figure out quickly over those years, and maybe it's not quickly, but they do figure out like why they're really here and what they're what gives them joy and what they're supposed to do. And for me, over those years, I eventually figured out, and the reason I do social media so much is even though it's a relationship where I'm just speaking to people, for me, you know, using the old metaphor of like the fisherman and give people a fish or teach them a fish, like like I'm more interested in creating the pond for people. Like that's the thing that gives me the most joy. And when I'm writing threads or I'm like uh, creating, you know, my associate program and like hiring people and coaching them into becoming entrepreneurs, like that is all the stuff where I feel like I'm giving somebody the pond and they can go in there and make out of it what they want to. And um, yeah, so that's ultimately like that's the impact I want to have. And that's why like, Eric, like what I would consider like junk views, like I consider my Airbnb posts like to be mostly junk views. I would much, yeah. I'm much more excited about like something that helps somebody change their life and I get 50,000 views on it than I am on a 5 million view viral post. Well, uh, you do a really views. good job. I think you're, you're a person who's always mentioned as somebody who really does a good job of staying on substance. And I, I have a tendency, I'm, you know, I'm very busy with my day job and my work. And so right. I like to get on there and I'll throw up like a TikTok video or something that's business related and interesting, I think. And it gets a lot of views. It's their vanity views. Like you said, I don't think that there's a whole lot of substance there, but it's, it's fun. I think it's fun and, you know, humorous content, but you do a really good job of regularly teaching, but also showing some personality. So I think you walk the line as well as anybody that I know. One of the things you also do, Michael, is you run a podcast called Acquisitions Anonymous, one of my favorite podcasts, um, if not my favorite podcast, where you guys analyze businesses. Um, you've looked at, at this point, I would, what, thousands of businesses on Acquisitions Anonymous and just generally in your life. And you have strong views on business buying. And when I first was introduced to the Michael Girdley brand, I thought you were, you know, kind of M&A expert now realizing you're kind of good at everything. Um, but um, let's let's talk about business buying for a few minutes. Because um, I think you yep. and I, we've had some back and forth. Because part of why Kevin and I started the firm and why, you know, there's a lot of people coming into this space is there is a belief that there is a lot of opportunity in business buying. The silver tsunami or the great wealth transfer or whatever um, you know, the, the number that gets thrown around and I've probably tweeted it entirely too many times that I've had to stop, uh, is like seven to $10 trillion worth of baby boomer, small businesses that have to be sold to a third party because unlike your family, they don't have kids or anybody who's interested in taking the business. And so they have to go to market with it. My belief is that in that seven to $10 trillion, assuming those numbers are accurate and I'm sure they you know fluctuate day to day. There's a lot of opportunity. The opportunity is not necessarily that every business is a business that you want to go out and buy, right? Because there are a ton of issues, particularly on Main Street with businesses. But what I believe is that even in the areas where there are businesses that you don't necessarily want to buy, those businesses have customers. They have market share. And to the extent that those businesses ultimately don't sell and they get shut down, whatever, that market share doesn't go poof. It it goes somewhere. And so for young, industrious people who want to work on Main Street, I think that this there's a generational opportunity. That's my, that's my thesis. Um, not everybody agrees with me on that because obviously the Main Street is difficult. Buying business is difficult. Give us your thesis on business buying. Having looked at thousands of them, what do you think the opportunity is for, for young people in terms of buying businesses? Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you. Like, I think there's tons of opportunity there for people to choose that lifestyle. So I don't want to poop on that. You know, I think that it's just the danger. I think myself and a lot of other olds, like Red Zeller is one of those. I put us in the olds category. He's close to my age, I think. Um, though he doesn't ski like he doesn't he doesn't Shout ski like Reg. somebody my age. Um, but I mean, it's there's a level of just, and I think you guys have seen it on the other side of post acquisition, like. Like business is hard, right? And there's yeah. there's a level of old folks like me that are like, hey, like make sure you know what you're getting into when you deal with this stuff. And you know, I think Brent Bashore has a great line about most small businesses are not small by choice, right? And it's because there's some hard stuff yeah. about what they're doing. So look, I totally agree with you. Like I think there's tons of opportunity for somebody to go to go buy a beautiful business. And I, I encourage them to do that. 
Uh, it's also a situation where because of Twitter and the stuff you've been talking about, I've been talking about, there's a lot more people hunting a pretty narrow aperture of the types of deals that people really want. And if you go look at every searcher, they all have the same 10 checkboxes. I want recurring revenue. I want diversified client base. I want it in this thing. I want it four miles from my house. And like, it's like, you know, like that does limit down the number of businesses that are out there. And because there's still so much capital in the world, and I've seen this going from, you know, being 29 to 49, like, like just the amount of money just sloshing around in people's pockets in the American economy and investor pockets, like it's unreal compared to what it was like when I graduated college. Like it's like, it's just a different planet. Uh, everything from SBA lending to the banks, to the family offices, like just the wealth we've created in this country over the past 40 years is just like sloshing around. And I think, you know, that means prices are high. And to some extent, that's also why like, I keep incubating stuff because I'm like, wait, I got to pay eight times EBITDA for this business or I can go pay one times EBITDA and start a business that's going to be worth that much in three years. Like, shut up. I'll just start a business. <laughs> much more fun. When assets are expensive, you create assets. So anyway, that was a well, bunch of a, nonsensical a... opinions about your question. <laughs> so there you go. No, we'll get more concrete. So, you know, there's there's a lot of debate, zero, zero to one versus buying and, and building. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I can't find two people that waffle between the two. There's strong opinions on both sides. If you had to start over from scratch today, you had, you know, nothing. Uh, what are you buying or are you building? Uh, am I me right now with my skill set or I'm like a 22 year old without Tw my skill set? either way both first of all it'd be like it makes some great tv like it's like you drop okay. me like on a deserted island but the island is actually i love like, it give you it's like a reality tv Detroit. in the way i'd like to consume yeah. five grand and it's due in 90 days what do you do five grand and it's due in you're 90. shopping businesses not wives right like we don't need the bachelor yeah. we need uh yeah yeah i think i mean if you're a 22 year old without any management experience or leadership experience or sales experience or any of that kind of stuff i think starting uh, starting a business is is most likely preferable for those people just because it's lower risk and and that sort of thing. If you're a 27 year old and like you've realized having worked for somebody else at a small business that you want to work and and lead a 30 person company and not start a two person company and try to grow it to a 30 person company, I think buying a business is is perfectly good. So um, I've done both. Like, look, if if assets were cheaper, I would probably be doing more business buying, but assets are still really expensive. So so anyway, I like. I, I don't mean to duck your question, Eric, but I like, I'm not, no, I think, it, I think both circumstance. What do you think of the, the MBA? So you just left Wharton, you know, you have exp you worked at Goldman and you never really worked on main street. You just, you know, you just left Wharton. Are you going and buying a small business or are you doing something different to kind of segue, uh, between those two worlds? Uh, for them, I mean, I think there's, I don't think there's any reason to think that an MBA should preclude or should tell you what to do one way or another. Like, if that's what you want to do, like, this is a world of opportunity or Wharton or GSB, like, the world is your oyster. If you want to go work for McKinsey, go work for McKinsey. If you want to go buy a business, go buy a business. Like, um, I think it all comes down again to that lifestyle that you want to have. And, you know, my podcast co-host, Bill D'Alessandro, talks about one of his buddies from investment banking who is typical Goldman type stuff. And he decided he wanted to get out of the corporate, you know, consulting and all that kind of stuff, I banking rat race. And uh, he went and found a chicken franchising concept that was growing in the Southeast. And the first thing you had to do is go work in the chicken restaurant for a year. And Bill talks about like day three, he calls down there and the guy like answers the phone, like, you know, Hey, chicken shack. And like, like he's done great. Chicken he's shack. opened up dozens of these things and he's a multimillionaire and he's going to create generational wealth for his family and stuff like that. And it's great. Like he could totally do that. Yeah. So I think my answer is like, I, if you have an MBA or you have skills or whatever, like choose what's going to make you happiest. This is way off topic, Michael, but have you seen this viral thing with this guy, Jet, uh, Jet, he, his, his girlfriend is Pookie and he's like, Pookie is oh, looking yeah. fire tonight. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah I see that. I didn't know his name was Chet. Massively but. viral thing. His first name is Jet. They've become like uber famous overnight. He's an investment banker. He runs a P fund out of Atlanta or something yeah. like that. But they dug into his background because everybody's super interested in this couple for whatever reason. And it turns out that his grandfather owns one of the large uh, chicken franchises out of Georgia. I can't think of the name of it right now. But the internet was like, he's heir to the chicken 
throne uh, or whatever, chicken yeah. fortune, you know, I was cracking. I was like, I don't think that's, you know, I think it's probably good, you know, but it's probably a lot like walking into a fireworks uh, business at 29 and having to figure it out, oh, man. you know, uh, so. Anyways, uh, every so business I tend, every business I tend to get into has gotten progressively easier than fireworks to where, oh, I'm to sure where today, to where today, like my last couple of businesses are like a staffing company, uh, a media company, like, like it just, <laughs> every time it's just like, I, you know, coming from that, I'm just like, I just want the easiest business possible. And, and I'll be sure. in these businesses and like a media business, you look at it and you're like, we're not doing that great. And you look at your financials, you're like, we're killing it. Like, it's going really well. So I would say that. Well, I've, one thing I've never told this story before. I don't even know that I've told you this, Kevin, but when I was uh -oh. at Kirkland, my brother David and I, who's now our chief of staff at SMB Law Group, we started yeah. a residential uh, cleaning business with like Jobber, having, just having fun, you know, just goofing around. Uh, see if we get some MRR going with like the local, we, we named it after the local shopping center or whatever. And uh, it was a disaster uh, of just spectacular proportions. And we were steadily making progress and we had, you know, contracts, very easy to acquire business, very difficult to find work, very difficult to get that work to show up. Uh, clients, incredibly challenging. Um, and him and I, it's kind of funny, him and I are such different people. Uh, the night before our first job, we got ghosted by one of our cleaners, whatever. And I'm laughing because I just, I have a sense of humor about things. David, right. Kevin, not laughing. I mean, not laughing at all. Just like very upset. Uh, so, but ever since we've done that, you know, be running the law firm now and whatever, dramatically easier experience, obviously, than that little, uh, Interestingly circus. though, I can't ever get Eric to clean the toilets and, uh. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's just... that was our downfall. We shut it down. <laughs> I got I was working at Kirkland and Ellis and this lady called to complain and she chewed me. I mean, she chewed me out about like the cleaners failed, to like clean the ceiling fan or something like that. And she was like, I have to go. I have a job, you know, and hung up. Oh. So I called my brother. I was like, I was like, we're winding oh. this thing down, bro. This is, this well, is no longer cold. fun. I was working at Kirkland and Ellis, you know, she, I'm like, lady, if you have no idea, you know, but anyways, I digress. Um, That'd be eight hundred dollars. Um, <laughs> yeah, Michael, right. have you have you acquired off of acquisitions anonymous? I've always wondered this. Have have that? Well, I guess in any of the panelists, you know, the the team on the podcast, have you have you come across a deal that you've analyzed on there and then thought kind of offline, this is interesting, and and actually ended up writing a check, whether as an investor or full acquire? I'm uh, we curious. have not. We got okay. we got pretty close on the worm farm. So okay. Mills started to look there. We never did a visit or anything, but we all wanted to do the war or the pizza boat. That's... We wanted to do the pizza boat in a uh, Virgin Islands. So, but no, we've not really seen Ooh, anything like the that sounds we've of that. Ended up... Okay. Michael, I'm going to get you to commit. So you've been ducking all my questions to this point in the interview, but I'm going to get you to commit here. Cause I'm going to use your own words against you. So I'm going <laughs> to, so you, in terms of business buying, you know, obviously circumstance dependent, but the type of business you should buy, you have strong feelings on. Tell me in what, you know, you wrote a, a, a really good post on having looked at over a thousand businesses, 11 biggest traps to avoid in business buying. And number one is something that's fairly controversial, which is buying a job, buying too right. small. And some folks, very successful buyers, um, like Mike Bakken, who's local to me here, you know, he bought very small to start, scaled and learned the ins and outs of the business and ultimately had a, you know, a, a pretty successful buyout, you know, from an outside uh, perspective exit. Talk to us about your philosophy on business buying and why you're against buying a job, so to speak. Yeah. Well, buying yourself and a I job get, is... And Okay. And sorry, just to level set, it'd probably be helpful for listeners what you mean sure. by buying a job. Yeah, yeah. Just, just buying your, yeah, buying yourself a job is, yep. to me, buying yourself a business uh, that only you can run, right? So, for example, like we've the classic example I give on, uh, on Acquisition Anonymous is, let's say you run a digital agency. Everybody kind of knows small-scale digital agencies tend to tap out around two, two and a half million, three million in revenue. The reason is, is because ultimately the moat is the owner has relationships with the clients, right? And so right. It, ultimately there's a little value there that if the, you know, the clients leave and if the owner leaves. So we see that often in terms of, of businesses and there's, there is inherently nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, buying a business where it requires you to work in it for it to be successful. 
I think the mistake is, and the reason I list that as a mistake is there's a lot of people that I talk to who are looking at buying businesses that don't realize that's the case. They don't realize that they buy this business and their exit opportunity is shut the business down or sell it to somebody else who's buying themselves a job. And I think it's totally fine if you're going into that uh, understanding what you're getting into and there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Mike Botkin's a great example, can make you rich. Uh, but I think the mistake is people don't identify that they're getting buying themselves a job and they get stuck and they look up three years from now and they're like, oh, I can't do like a hold co and stuff. It's like, no, no, get your ass in there and talk to some clients. Otherwise the business is shutting down. So that's that's number one there. So how big of a business do you want to acquire if you're a first time buyer, in your opinion? Uh I think I think there's an inflection point um where if I was gonna do an SBA loan and have it fully PG'd, I would wanna just max out my SBA loan. Uh All the I think way. if I I think there's a gap in the middle where I would above the SBA limit, I would want to do something bigger because I'm gonna have to raise money for it. I'd want to be in the twenty to thirty million EV range. I think kind of the five to twenty million EV range puts you like in this weird no man's land where you raise you it's just like too small for you and the investors to all make a bunch of money and for it to be worth your time. So I would say those are the two the two kind of size wise points. Like either you can own hundred uh, percent unless you get very creative of a small fully SBA backed business that you're PGing. Uh, or you just go bigger than that, the 20 to 30 million plus in EV. Try not to do stuff in the middle. Um, so I, I didn't mean to duck your question. You said I was ducking your questions. I'm trying not to. So <laughs> that's a very specific answer. It's good. I feel like I'm interviewing a lawyer here. He's like, ah, oh, it depends, Eric. I, uh, you know, there's a variety of circumstances we have to evaluate. So Well, yeah. I mean, this, uh, is, this happens when you get old. This happens when you get old is <laughs> everybody you know wants to You become to be less and less sure. Everybody yeah, wants the world a, to be we, black and white. And I'm just like, okay, well, like shades are great. Like it's all shade. I mean, obviously there's things like don't murder anybody, guys. But like, <laughs> is it right to do this or do that? Well, it depends. Like it always depends. And that's why that's why I'm just, maybe yeah. I'm a lame interview. So sorry. We we had uh, we had Nick Huber on the pod a few weeks ago and he gave us nothing but one sentence, very aggressive, very concrete answers to all of our questions. So um I'm I'm kidding. Is that true? I haven't listened to that shout yet. Out, shout out to Nick. Um well. It's not untrue, I would say, Kevin. This is, yeah, this is a this is a testament to how out of control Eric's life is because we had Nick on the pod like eight months ago, not a few weeks ago. It's a, has it been that long? <laughs> it's been it's been a while. It was last summer. Look, that like kind July. of those kind of I can give you those answer those types of answers that and they make for good radio, but the reality is like. Like I get much more joy out of just telling people the truth about stuff. And well, like, and not, I, I mean, not, yeah. not to take this back to like content, but I mean, that's, that's one of the most frustrating things that's about, exactly where about the content from. game online is yeah. because there are so many just unbelievably strong hot takes that I'm, you know, kind of pulling my hair out. Like guys, there is a million miles of gray between point A and B yeah. that you're just taking an absolutely like, you know, come hell or high water approach to that i just you know and losing that nuance i think can do a big disservice to the community with people who are out there pging loans and things like that yeah. like it's important to spend time in that gray area and to your point michael you know really understand those risks and know what you're getting into so. I, I think it's frustrating for serious players right to see the one sentence anecdotal stuff that they feel like is designed to sell uh, and that, that's where I, if I, if I've ever gotten in trouble on social media, which I've gotten in trouble a few times, um, it was the times that I've been a little bit too, um, I, I haven't provided enough substance or, or, uh, uh context if you will, yeah. but it's hard. You know, I, you, you write a lot of threads, Michael, and I don't know how you find time to do it. Frankly, it's, uh, it's really impressive. Uh, we have a whole content, content machine now. I've, I've yeah, talk I'm to a lazy about person. Media. I can tell you, all, I can tell you media? all about it. Yeah. And so th is this entrepreneurship 3.0 for you? Is this kind of the next phase of kind of teach and media? Like talk, talk us, talk to us about where Girdly World fits into yeah. and, and Girdly Media fits into your kind of overall vision for life. Yeah. Well, Girdly Media has started out as very much an effectuation style thing. It's like, oh, hey, I have all these followers and I have time with Twitter. And then I realized as I kept trying to scale that and have greater impact, which I've talked about, that's what gives me joy. Like, I couldn't do it alone. And um, I also had a constraint that I knew it wasn't sustainable if I was going to like just write checks out of pocket for like staff to help me. So like that's why we've set it up as a, its own business. And I'm like a 
carpenter with a hammer. Like everything looked like a nail. I was like, okay, we'll set up another business just like I've set up the other yeah. 12. And, um, and so the idea of Girdly Media is set up very much effectuation. It's like, okay, let's go start running experiments and see what works. Like we've tried doing courses. We do advertising. Um, we're incubating some new media properties now. Uh, we're running the Acquisitions Anonymous podcast, um, doing YouTube, going really hard on YouTube. So those are all kind of effectuation style experiments and we'll be able to double down on the stuff that really works. Um, and where that all fits in, I think there's two minds right now of where it all ends up. Um, one, there's one person in my organization who thinks ultimately the media stuff will be bigger than everything else put together. I'm like, that's pretty big. Um, so she thinks that. Um, I'm like, I don't know, like, let's, let's just keep making good stuff and see how it works and try not to lose money and, uh, and keep evolving it from there with the vision of having greater impact. So, you know, right now at minimum, it's a way not to lose money and to accelerate everything else I'm involved in and make it easier. Like it's super easy to recruit. It's super easy to launch businesses. It's super easy to help my businesses. Uh, cause I just have an audience that gets to see my stuff because I've given them a bunch of material so far for free in the form of threads and stuff like that. What part of it are you most excited about? You mentioned scale path. Um, talk to us about the part of it that kind of gets you excited. Oh, uh, look, I get the most joy out of two things. I get the most joy out of taking stuff and having insights to create a new business around that. So scale path is, you know, as, as now as a CEO peer network, and I'll talk about how we've ended up there. Um, but taking those kind of insights and using that as a way to arrange myself and other people, uh, to turn that into a business and get the first dollar in the door. And we were profitable month three, that kind of stuff, like super fun. Um, and then I get the second, second most joy out of after something is going like helping and growing the right leader inside of those businesses. So Sam Trumps is my business partner there. He and I co-founded the company together. My job is to help Sam be the best Sam and Sam's building the business. And then I help. Um, help him when I can. And so I get joy out of those two things. And if you look at it, that's what my whole day is. My whole day is either having insights and then we create a business and they get it set up or helping the existing leadership like grow and build the business to be the best it can. It's to me, that's super fun. <laughs> like I'll do that all day. It doesn't even feel like work. Um, all right. What, how should we end, guys? Yeah, I'm looking at the clock here, so I think we're, we're freestyle raps. The wall. I could duck one of Eric's questions. He, he wants you want to just keep ducking. I keep going to Blue Quartz. Let's go. Well, well, we'll I think we'll that I think the nat I think Kevin. the natural place to end then, and and try not to duck this one, Michael, is where does Chili's fit into this this overall vision, and and yeah. is this a real thing? Like, how many days a week are you actually eating yeah, yeah, food I want from a, a Chili's? I want a actual number of how many days on average in 2023 you, how many days per week in 2023 on average were you at Chili's? Like point Don't duck one, it. point two. So how many, <laughs> that's not a lot. No. Um, so what, once a month, once every six weeks. Something Look, like. guys, that's real, real bro talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, okay. All right. Breaking I'm about news. to give you, Eric, I'm so sorry. I'm about to give you a nuanced answer to, Please. I, I know Let's go. I know what you want to hear is I love the fajitas and the margaritas and it's the best in the world. Yeah, screw you, Texas Roadhouse. Like I that's not the truth. The, the truth is for me, Chili's has become representation of something I love about America and also I hate about America. And the thing I hate about America is there are people on the coasts. There are New York, LA, San Francisco, wherever. Uh there's some of them in Chicago, all these big cities. And everything is, has to be unique and special and perfect and runway runway level food, right? Yeah. And like, if it's not different than everywhere else, like it's it's horrible, right? And those other the, the hinterlands don't understand it. And I understand. And I felt this viscerally when I lived in San Francisco, and I would talk to the people there. And basically, if you told them the world ended it's just south of San Jose, and you fell off into a crevice and you never came out, they would believe you, right? They just didn't even understand there was this other part of America that, to me. And where you, you know, Kevin, you live in Dallas, like we live in Flyover America. And I think there's so much going on for Flyover America. And it's a disservice that so much of America looks down on Flyover America. And San Antonio, Nashville, Cleveland, Dallas, all these places, even Alabama, like these are places that there's a ton of beauty. And if you go into a place like Chili's, 
Like it is something that's affordable. It's uniform. It's totally approachable by families. And you go in there and it's just normal people living their best lives and doing their best thing for their family. And they don't give a crap about what's going on, on Twitter. They don't care about what's going on with the Kardashians. They don't care about Michelin stars. And there's a level of beauty in that. And to me, like I live in Flyover America and I think it's beautiful for that reason. There's just people being good people, living their lives without all the politics and crap and all that kind of stuff. And Chili's represents this idea to me. And that's why I talk about it so much. And uh, if you see me just replying to somebody with a picture of a Chili's restaurant, that's what I'm telling. Like, slow your roll there, Mr. Elite. Like there's beauty everywhere. And that's I the idea love of Chili's. It. That's huge. That's breaking news. Also, you didn't answer my question, but I'll, we'll take it. I uh, told you, like I go like once every two months. Like, just I don't eat yeah. that at all. No, that's that's <laughs> pizza. That's pizza for me. I mean, you nailed it. We've hit the same thread, which is I'll post a I posted a pizza from what is considered the best pizza place in Orlando, Florida, on Friday, and it got sixty thousand plus impressions of nothing but people tearing that pizza down and telling me <laughs> right. to throw it away. And I'm like, dude, it is bread with sauce, with cheese, with meat. Like, what is the problem here? Uh, but, you know, and somebody even commented, this This sums up your point exactly, Michael. And he said, that is terrible pizza. I'm from the Northeast. Yeah. Right. There's an elitism, and they're the only ones that do pizza correct. correctly. Correctly. Yeah. Oh, you guys have seen the Breezewood PA photo that's pretty famous. You know what I'm talking about? The one with the exit and it's just like horrible, sprawl looking stuff. All the, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, people don't slow down and think about what's beautiful there. Like you can drive up in your car while you're going all the, you're, you're on a road trip to see grandma. You could go from two. This is where we disagree. You could pick up food. There's nothing beautiful It's all there, instantly Michael. available that is, there. That you want to go to the bathroom? Take. There's like 12 bathrooms you can go to. Like, yeah, I know it's like, it's horrible sprawl, but like there's a level of beauty in there that if you are in a minivan with three screaming kids in the back and you need to give them some sugar to calm them down, uh, or, or, you know, to quiet them down, like there's some beauty in all of that. Right. And the people just need to slow their roll and appreciate it. It's not all, it's not all canned okra. He, he was on CNBC the other day. He said that they sell more margaritas than any restaurant in the world. And they yeah. sell a they sell a cheeseburger every second. Wow! Of the day, they're one Changing of the largest right sellers there. of burgers. I mean, come on! And then you're going to be like, "Who eats this food?" Everybody. Okay, Everybody. a lot of people are eating this food. You know, uh, I call that. You know, you're like, people are eating. It. Okay, I, I call that the Olive Garden effect. My my wife and I are like, I'm not. We don't want to. Olive Garden. Nobody likes that. None of my friends like it. Nobody I know likes it. My family doesn't like it. We never go there. Who could possibly like someplace that that is that crappy? And then you drive past the Olive Garden at like five thirty on a Tuesday. Yeah, it's, and an, it's an hour wait. Like yeah. there's people yeah. everywhere. <laughs> well, you know what's funny yeah. too is they'll go without reservations and they'll sit for like an hour, which to a lot of people is completely unfathomable to to go to a restaurant without reservations at all. But let alone. These people are diehard. It'll be like Mother's Day, load mom up in the car, go to OG, and sit and wait for like 90 minutes yeah. for that food to show mom yeah. a special occasion, you know? That's America right there. It's America. It's beautiful. Yeah. Shout Love out to it. mom. So. Well, cool. All right. So to wrap up, Michael, what uh, anything you want to plug, anything you want to call out specifically? I know we've talked about a lot of your ventures, but, you know, we always want to give folks whatever they're most excited about, whatever they're working on, whatever's coming next, any breaking news you want to announce of upcoming projects. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to hear you plug it to wrap things. Yeah, 100 percent. Well, the ask would be like uh Subscribe to my newsletter. I've got a full time person working with me. Please. It, I put ads in there. <laughs> I pay the bills. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you guys should watch out. I am working on, you can go to girdly.com for my newsletter. That's so my team will not yell at me for yeah. not plugging stuff, but I am working on a project that I think will make for the best Twitter and YouTube content in history. It's one of the craziest projects I've ever worked on. So we'll see. We'll see if I get to a you point where it's supposed to get announced in the next peak. six weeks or so. Yeah. Announce that it right now. This, this won't be released for six weeks. Let's announce it right now. Give us. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Damn it. We can come back and record it, but I cannot, I cannot. Fair, fair. Okay. All right. We'll do a short. We'll do a follow-up short. I'm excited. Let's do it. Now we Everything? should tell now we should tell Michael what we're gonna release in five weeks just to make sure that we're yeah. not gonna compete with each other. Dramatically similar. 
Hey, there's plenty for all of us. We're okay. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, the, unless you're doing it in San Antonio, we are not competing. It's fine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, very so. little risk that we're doing something in San Antonio right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Other than taking the Alamo when we do a billion dollars of M&A in one year. We're going to throw it Yeah, the Alamo. that was our yeah, plan. So, so we, we had planned to, uh, our, our law firm, which is separate from this, but we had planned to be number one in, in Texas in deal count, which frankly we, we may have done, Kevin. I don't even know. We'll have to look it up. Yeah, we're still waiting on the league um, tables. Waiting on the league tables. But uh, we were going to throw like a big party at the Alamo and rent, because you can rent the Alamo, which is super cool. Really, yeah. good. I don't know if that's a good venue or not, but just the concept that the idea of it's fun. So anyways, maybe we'll see you there. Let's go. Michael, it was a pleasure getting to know you a little more, hearing more about your business ventures. Thanks, thanks a ton for spending time with us. This is fantastic. Awesome. Thank you for having Thanks for listening to this episode of Mundane Millionaires. If you enjoyed what you heard in this episode, make sure to follow Mundane Millionaires wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. See you next time.